We will be primarily tonight in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13, 14. <laughs> Trying to get the whole Bible preached today, okay? We did the book of Revelation this morning. <laughs> Not really. We're not going to read all these, but most of our texts going to. There will be. We're going to do some jumping around, okay? But but uh, just I hope you follow with me. Um, I didn't know exactly where to go with this, but I felt like covering the the subject and, I, and the text kind of led me. I mean, uh, studying kind of led me to this. But we're going to talk about the idea of prophesying in the house of God, and so we're going to have to talk a little bit about what prophesying is. Look at some scriptures that deal with. The subject, and uh, and then uh, here's what we're going to do. What is prophesying? Who can be a prophet? And then in what manner should one prophesy in the church? That's what we're talking about. Okay, let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you once again for meeting here, and as it's already been pointed out, Lord, meeting with your your people and and uh, uh, gathering around your word, Lord, our fellowship with one another, and our fellowship is truly with you. Uh, as it says in First John, I pray, Lord, that you'll bless the service, bless all those that came out, and those that can't be here, Lord, feed them, and uh, feed them spiritually, and help them to uh, uh, draw closer to you as well. I pray that you'll bless this time now, and show us what, what you have for us, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, is basically introducing the idea of spiritual gifts. And uh, uh, so you read through that, and it talks about the different gifts that people are given. The Lord, the, the Holy Spirit gives different gifts in the church, and you, you see that uh, famous passage where, where Paul says uh, uh, he gives some kind of ridiculous uh, illustrations, and he talks about what if, if the whole body was an eye? You know, and it said, oh, because I'm not the ear, I'm not part of the body or whatever. That would be silly, right? What if the whole... And so he's talking about how in the body of Christ, uh, there's lots of different gifts that are given, okay? Then you get to chapter 13, and his point there is like, hey, all the gifts that the Spirit might give you, they don't mean a thing if, the, if charity is not involved, right? It says he's given us a gift for a reason. What is that reason? To reach other people with the gospel, show them love, care for them. And all this, uh, love God's people, help them do all these things, that's charity. And your spiritual gift doesn't really mean anything without charity. And then in chapter 14, we see this emphasis on prophecy. And Paul says, uh, all these gifts are good, but he says, and covet to, be, uh, co covet to prophesy, uh, to have that spiritual gift. He says that's actually the best spiritual gift you can have. So, so that makes you ask some questions. I remember... Uh, a uh, couple of different churches I've been in growing up, they had these questionnaires. I'm not big on, necessarily big on these, but questionnaires. And if you filled out this questionnaire, it would let you know what your spiritual gift was. Anybody ever seen one of those? And, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, here's what I think people do. They kind of have a preconceived idea going into the test what their gift is. And so they fill out the answers accordingly in the end. Oh, look, I'm a, I'm a prophet. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not judging anyone's motive. I'm just saying, I don't know about the, the wisdom of taking that test and saying, this is my spiritual gift. But one thing we know, if you're in the body of Christ, if you're in the church, uh, in your, you know, you're a member of the church, God's given you some kind of gift, some kind of an ability uh, and, and a way to be involved and, and what have you. And we might not know exactly what, what that is at first. I know I struggled for a long time. What is my gift? I, I mean, I still don't say, I don't know that I can pinpoint exactly what my gift is, but you look through the Bible and, and we see these different gifts, okay? So I remember when they used to take those tests and somebody said, I, uh, 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 I believe, according to this test, that I am a prophet. Some people got really concerned thought, we're not one of those kind of churches <laughs> where, you know, you see these visions and you, you speak these in a, in a weird tongue and, and, you, and you start prophesying about future events or, 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 you know, God gives you visions or dreams and you start prophesying. That's how they interpreted that gift of prophecy. And they said, well, that's, that's weird. We're not. Well, the Bible makes it very clear about this prophecy and, and about having gifts of prophecy in, in the church. So the question is, what are we talking about? Okay. 
So you go back, one of the first references to a prophet or prophesying is in the book of Numbers. Now, hold, we will be in, in 1 Corinthians a lot, but hold your place there and go to Numbers, if you would. Numbers chapter 11. We all know that Moses had a, a difficult job leading the, the children, the Hebrew children through the wilderness. And, and boy, they kept complaining at God and, and telling Moses, what did you bring us out here to kill us? What's going on? And it seemed like every time God would perform a miracle, they would enjoy the benefits of that miracle. And then immediately they'd be murmuring and complaining and, and all. And, and Moses kind of gets, he finally gets fed up. He's give, now God's given him manna, this holy food. Uh, I call it whatchamacallits because <laughs> that's what manna means is what is it? <laughs> you know? And so he's given this food that just grows in the morning just miraculously. And it must not have tasted too bad. So it tasted like uh, honey and coriander seed. I have no idea what coriander seed tastes, tastes like, but uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, there's some kind of a uh, uh, flavor there. It's not, probably not a really strong flavor, but... Uh, but, but they had that, and it grew apparently like with the frost on the ground in the morning time. It was right there, and they could just go out, and they could collect it. Well, they ended up eating this for a real long time, but, but I, I, and I don't know to what extent they were able to maybe occasionally kill one of their cattle or have some kind of meat or, or whatever, uh, find a bird and kill it and eat it. I don't, I don't know, but they were sick of manna, and so they started crying about it, and, and I'm not, I don't want to be too judgmental, because if I get hungry, I get pretty cranky too, <laughs> but they start crying about it. Man, I wish we had the leeks and the onions and the garlic like we did back when we were slaves. Let's just go back and be slaves so we can have <laughs> leeks and onions and garlic. That's a weird concept, all right? Otherwise, we're just going to die out here in this wilderness. No, you're looking at God providing a spiritual bread every morning, and you think God's going to let you die? But that's what they do, okay? So then you come to Numbers 11, and look at verse 16 here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee, and I will come down and talk with, with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and will pour it upon them that they shall bear the burden of the people with thee and thou, that thou bearest it not thyself alone. Because Moses, he, he's, he's crying out to God. I, I just can't deal with these people. Why did you, why did you, I mean, I'd rather die. I mean, kill me, I pray thee, he says in verse 15. <laughs> you know, and if I, uh, 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 let me see, he says, am I not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me? And if thou sh deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see this wretchedness. Okay, that's how disgusted he is with it. So God says, pick 70 men that you know are elders, you know, you know they're worthy. Kind of reminds me of when Jethro gave him advice about, I mean, because Jethro saw Moses out there from morning to night, standing there just judging people. One at a time they'd come, bring their problems, and he'd have to discern for them, you know, what is right and what's wrong, and okay, now do this, and go, you know. May. Well, eventually Jethro said, saw that and said, you're wearing yourself out. It's not good for you. It's not good for the people standing there 24 hours a day, waiting in line. He said, so... He's, and, he, and he graciously said, now, if God will allow you to do this, you know, if, if not, that's between you and God. But here's a good idea, basically, is what he says. Choose some men out there that are good men, filled with the Holy Ghost, and, they, and you know you can trust them and whatever, and make them rulers over thousands and over hundreds and over fifties, and, and let them judge, and then they can just bring the really big matters to you, right? That's what he ends up doing. Then God gives him uh, uh, the, the law, Right, he go, right after that, this is in chapter 18 where he uh, divides the people, the, the, makes these judges. And in verse 20, he goes up to the mountain and receives the law. The idea, I believe, is that, hey, now God's going to give you his word. They've got, a, they've got it written down. Moses can teach them what the law says. And now they can be judges over the people according to, to the law. So that kind of reminds me of the story. But now, now he's saying, take these 70 men, these 70 elders... 
and just bring them here and they'll stand before you and I'll, I'll talk to you uh, about this, okay? So uh, let me see here. Let's go with uh, verse 19. Okay, let, let's back up. Where did I leave off? Anybody? And I will come down at 17. I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the spirit that is with upon you. I know I already read it, but let's do it again. And will pour it upon them that they shall bear the burden of the people with them, that thou bearest it not alone. And say thou unto the people, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. Not, not, he's not talking about to the elders, okay? This is what he wants them, him to say to the people. Sanctify yourselves unto tomorrow. Uh, that, and, and ye shall eat flesh... For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out of your nostrils. And it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord, which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came ye forth out of Egypt? Okay, so Moses said to the people, uh, I mean, Moses said this to God. He said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh. That, they, that, doesn't talk, that doesn't even include their families. I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them? I mean, they're going through the wilderness. They have some flocks. They have some, some uh, cattle and sheep, whatever. But, but uh, to kill them all off, you know, then they wouldn't have anything when they got in the promised land. So they're real, you know, using these things sparingly, if they're using them at all. I don't know. In fact, they've got to feed them, too. But he's saying, shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together uh, for them to suffice them? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether uh, my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Okay, so Moses went out, told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. The Lord came down in a cloud. And he spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was upon him, Moses, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Now, I don't know exactly what happened. You know, you tend to think of prophesying like these guys just were like in a trance. And they got these, this vision or something to say. Words are just coming out of their mouth and they're babbling or something like that. I don't know if that's the case or not. Certainly throughout the Bible, prophets are some pretty interesting characters. <laughs> Think about Isaiah and, and uh, Elijah. I mean, there's some interesting characters in the, in the Bible that are called prophets, but I don't really know what they're saying, I mean, what they're, what they're doing that makes them prophets. But I know that the Word of God, I mean, the Spirit of God has come upon them, the Spirit that was on Moses. It's almost like it diversified, okay, spread out among all the 70 elders. And now they are under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. They are going out and they're proclaiming something. That's what prophesying is, okay? They're going out there and they're saying, thus saith the Lord. Now, what did the Lord say? I can pretty much guarantee what they're going through the camp. Well, some, most of them were outside of the camp. There were two inside the camp. And here's what they're saying, I bet you. I bet you. Because you complained, God is going to make you eat the... <laughs> <laughs> for 30 days until it's coming out of your nostrils. I mean, I think that's what they were saying, and they're, and they're proclaiming the word that God told to Moses to tell this to the people. So now they're going around the camp, and they're screaming at people, I, I guess. I mean, <laughs> preaching has to do with heralding the truth, and, and uh, so they're, they're saying this, and they're, they're, judgment is coming upon you, and boy, does it come upon them. I mean, later on, it says, while the meat is still in their teeth, God causes a plague to come upon the people. That was planned. But it's like the people are saying, hey, sanctify yourself. You know, get right with the Lord because he's fixing to, to judge you. And I think that was basically what they were prophesying. <clears throat> so what is prophesying? I don't believe that uh, it necessarily has to do with predicting the future. Unless that's what God wants somebody to proclaim. So when he gave Daniel maybe a vision or Joseph a vision and it had to do with future events, that was prophecy. 
But prophesying doesn't necessarily have to do with future events. It just has to do with proclaiming what God said. Uh, now, sometimes uh, it could manifest its stuff in, uh, itself in different ways. I believe today, uh, you know, how do you, how can I prove this? I guess I can't really prove this except that we do see, and I don't have time to, to preach all of Corinthians here, uh, nor am I prepared to do so, but, um, but we do see that certain gifts disappear. They fall off the scene. Tongues, this, this uh, special gift of tongues, it says, will cease. That ceases. Uh, there seems to be things that kind of go off of the scene. So here's what I think the reason for that is. I, I don't know that I can actually prove it from the Bible, other than there are some places the Bible talks about a more perfect word, you know. And uh, uh, here's what I think. God used to speak to men of, you know, to his men through visions, dreams. He would allow them to be able to do mir miraculous things, heal people, uh, do miracles. And, uh, and it was a sign. These were sign gifts, okay? Now, you, these are also the same men, these prophets, holy men of God spake, you know, as they received the word of God, uh, according to Peter, and so these are the guys who were writing down or, pro or speaking the word of God, which we now have in writing here. So what I believe is that we have here the entire word of God. Now, could God still lead somebody and talk? He, I, I suppose he could. I suppose he could, he could lead you in a direction in your life that you don't necessarily clearly see in the Bible. But if you want to know the mind of God, if you want to know what God's trying to say, you open this book, and he's going he's gonna to speak to you. The Holy Ghost is going to speak to you through the Word of God. Okay? Uh, so we we got to be real careful not, not kind of like putting our Bibles away and saying, you know, well, God is going to lead me, you know, to do this or that. And you try to point it to the Bible and say, well, the Bible says you shouldn't do that. Well, I know what God said to me. Well, that's dangerous because, you know, even Paul said, hey, if we say something different to you, if an angel from God comes down and says something different to you than what we've, you've, we've put in this Bible, don't believe them, <laughs> okay? And so we got to be careful not to just say, well, let me just consider what the Lord, you know, what he leads me to do. Well, I'll tell you how he's going to lead you. You're going to have to open up your word and see what it says, okay? So, uh, so I believe today prophesying has mostly to do for us with just opening up the word of God and proclaiming it. Now, he gives cert people certain abilities to do so. So back to 1 Corinthians. Uh, so what is prophesying? I believe it is under having a, an understanding of the Scripture and proclaiming it in the power of the Holy Ghost. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. Again. I told you to hold your place there, and I didn't. Oh, yeah, I did. Here's my marker. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets. You know, there's no more apostles left. Paul said he was the last one. He said, I, last of all, I, Jesus came to me. And one of the qualifications of being an apostle was that they had to see uh, Christ. And so he basically said, I am the last of the apostles. Okay? Uh, and so they're, they're off the scene. Secondary prophets. All right? Maybe he's talking about people that are off the scenes, or maybe he's talking about prophesying the word of God. I mean, it still is, is, exists today. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing. Uh, I just read today, I, I, a friend of mine, I guess. I mean, we're acquaintances and, and, and friendly when we see each other. But he's a pastor in somewhere in, I guess, Oklahoma, maybe close to the Kansas border. And he said that a guy came into his church this morning and wanted to have his head anointed with oil. And after talking to him, he found out that he wasn't saved. And so he led him to the Lord, and he got saved. So I was curious, and I was like, so did you anoint him with oil? Halfway joking. And he said, yes, we did. I've never heard of churches doing that. I mean, I have, and in the South, I think that's a common thing. So you ask, well, is that wrong? I wouldn't say that. Because if you read uh, James chapter 5, it says, if you're sick, go to the elders. They'll anoint you, and they'll pray over you, and maybe God will, <laughs> will heal you. But 
I believe that was kind of a medicinal thing. I mean, that was like going to the doctor, right? We have doctors now that God gives wisdom and stuff like that. I don't think you need to come to, to me and say, would you anoint my head with oil? I'll probably say, yeah, I just don't feel comfortable doing that, <laughs> okay? I'll pray for you, you know, and, and, uh, and do that. But anyway, so yeah, he anointed him. And, and, and all these, several guys came on there and said, yeah, we, we do that. You know, we do that. If somebody's sick, we anoint them with oil. I mean, you talk about a literal interpretation of, <laughs> of, of the Scripture. But so, you know, I don't believe that we really have those kind of healing uh, powers. If, if you're reading more into that than just a medicinal thing. I mean, you know, there's people that sell essential oils. And those, you know, they claim, hey, this will heal you. This will, you know, this will cure you. If you've got this kind of problem, hey, put a little oil right here. Breathe that stuff in like Vicks Vapor Rub or something, and that's going to clean you up. It's gonna... I'm okay with that. I don't mind vitamins. I don't mind uh, uh, these kind of homeopathic type treatments or whatever. I'm okay with that. Uh, I don't, I'm not against them. But I don't believe that we necessarily have the power. Now, God can heal anybody, okay? Somebody's sick, and you pray, and you ask God to heal them. God can heal anybody. I still believe that. But as far as laying your hands on somebody to the extent of, like, I'm going to perform a miracle right there. I don't believe we have that anymore. Okay, I believe that went away. So, uh, but anyway, he's talking about all these different gifts right here. And then, like I said, you get down uh, 13, chapter 13 talks about we don't, uh, that don't mean anything. These gifts don't mean anything unless we're doing it with charity. And then we come to 14 where he talks about prophecy a little bit more. So what is prophesying? We covered that. Now I want to address this question. Who can be a prophet? Or, because I believe ladies are involved here, a prophetess. Who could be a prophet? Who can be? And I want to say this. I believe anyone can, can prophesy. Anyone can be a prophet. See Acts chapter 2. Again, hold your place. We'll be coming back to Corinthians. Acts chapter 2. This isn't some kind of weird heresy I'm teaching, all right? <laughs> I didn't say everyone can be a pastor. I said everybody can prophesy. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. If you remember, this is the day of Pentecost. Holy Ghost moved. They were able to speak in tongues. Now that doesn't mean they spoke gibberish. What that means, I mean, it sounded like gibberish to some people, but what it means is they were able to speak tongues in such a way that somebody who spoke that language could hear it and understand it. And the Bible talks about tongues. It's always talking about different languages from different... If it's an unknown tongue, that means nobody understands what you're saying. That doesn't mean it's not a, a real uh, language. But anyway, uh, and so this happened, and the disciples are doing that, and who else is, is doing it? I don't know, but they're, they're seeing... They're, Speaking, it lists all these different uh, nationalities that were there, their uh, mother tongues, and they're hearing it in their mother tongue. And Peter says here, uh, These are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He's talking about Joel 2. You can go to it and see it sometime. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, according to him, what was going on there in Acts 2 was a fulfillment of that prophecy. And it seems to me like he's saying that it included children, it included uh, uh, women, and what have you. So how does that apply to us today? Well, I believe if we were going soul winning or door knocking and we were going out to proclaim the gospel, to go to the doorstep and say, hey, have you ever, you know, or, or whatever, just visiting with somebody in the neighborhood or, or whatever, that God, no matter who you are, if you're a child, if you're a woman, if you're a man, you know, whatever age or whatever, God can, through the Holy Spirit, kind of help you to have the boldness and power uh, to proclaim the gospel as you have understanding, as the Holy Spirit uh, brings to mem your memory the understanding of that. And I, I believe all people can do that. That would be called prophesying. 
In the Bible, speaking of women prophesying, in the Bible, there are ladies who are called prophetesses. Miriam, Deborah, here's a great name, Noadiah. Uh, I, I, I kind of like that name. Maybe we need to have another daughter, Noadiah. <laughs> you don't like Noadiah? <laughs> They're called prophetesses. She's giving me a, a, a strange look here. Then again, I'm the one that nicknamed, uh, I mean, put Zachary's middle name is Blaze. That was my idea. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, in, anyway, uh, that was, <laughs> who, who didn't know that his middle name was Blaze? <laughs> That's a good name, Zachary Blaze Randall. Anyway, so uh, he does. It was prophetic because he, he likes to play with fire. He's a fire bug. <laughs> Maybe he'll be a fireman one day, okay? All right, so uh, also in the New Testament, we see Stephen's daughters in Acts 21. Uh, it, says, it talks about Stephen's wife and his virgin daughters prophesied. Okay, so they were, they were prophesying. They were, I believe they were basically what we might call soul winners, uh, you know, and, and they, they knew the Bible and they proclaimed the Word of God, okay? So we know what prophesying is. I pretty much summarized this. I believe that all can... Uh, can prophesy. In fact, uh, Paul says over and over, he seems to imply in chapter 14 of our text here, that everybody should want to be, have that gift of prophecy. It's the best one. Covet after it, he says. And, uh, and it's interesting. I left this out of reading in, in, in uh, Numbers uh, there, but, but what happens after all these 70 men are prophesying, is a young man from the camp comes and runs to uh, Moses. And Joshua's standing there too. And he says, the guys are prophesying. And Moses says, are you jealous for me? He's like, I would that all, men, all of God's people prophesied. <laughs> you, know? you, are, you think I'm going to be like, you know, oh, how dare them prophesy? That's my job. He's like, no, I would that all men prophesy. And that's kind of what Paul's saying. He's like, I want everybody to be able to prophesy. Now, uh, there are some guidelines for this, and again, I want to emphasize that I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying that everybody can be a pastor. The Bible makes it clear that there are certain qualifications. Okay, I believe a person has to be a man. Uh, I believe he's supposed to be married, uh, and the husband of one wife is what it says. And so, there's some people interpret that a little bit differently, but I think these are qualifications. Okay, blameless, meaning that there's no major thing that the, everybody in the community is like, don't you know that he's, he's done this before? Or he's, uh, and he's not supposed to be a, a striker, you know, not getting in fist fights. And, and there are some, you say, well, nope, preacher would be, there are some preachers who have gotten in, gotten in fist fights with their deacons. I've heard of it. <laughs> okay. and, uh, and all these qualifications, okay, that I think are, are very important. And you say, well, somebody has already messed up in one area or another, and they say, I don't meet the qualifications. I guess God can't use them anymore. That's not true. You can still prophesy. You can still do the work of an evangelist. You can still do, I believe you can be a missionary and have, having messed some of that up as long as you're not pastoring over the church. If you're you know, starting a church, soul winning, getting people gathered up, and then helping turn it over to somebody else or whatever, I think there's still various ways that you can serve the Lord. You don't have to be a pastor. And, uh, and I don't... I don't think that applies to anybody in here, but you'd be amazed how many people out there want so badly to be a pastor. And if you tell them that they're not qualified, they'll think that you're telling them, hey, you are just like dirt, you're scum. Nobody, God doesn't want to use you anymore. And that can't be the far, any farther from the truth. God wants to use everybody, okay? But there are certain things, which brings me to my next point. In what manner should one prophesy in the church? Now, here's some guidelines, all right? And this is the rest of the message right here. First of all, the prophesying should be done unto edification. All right, First, first uh, uh, Corinthians 14 says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gift, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, that's one of the gifts somebody might say, say they have, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. It's unknown because nobody understands it, right? For no man uh, understandeth him. How, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But 
He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Okay? So, uh, uh, well, let's just keep reading. And I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than him that speaketh with, with tongues, except he interpret, the church may receive edifying. Okay? So he, he's saying this. If you speak in tongues, great. If you can just speak Spanish and you just start, you know, just preaching in Spanish. How many in here speak Spanish? Most of us wouldn't have a clue what they were saying. <laughs> right? So uh, or someone comes in and speaking another thing. Now, if they did, because they, you know, they're just not from around here, they speak Spanish. And someone says, hey, I know Spanish. And they interpreted for them. We would understand what he's saying if, if we trust the interpreter. Right. And anyway, later on in the chapter, he talks about uh, uh, speaking in tongues and having an interpreter as well. But, uh, but let's just go on. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall it profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? For if a trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? You know, they're standing out in the battlefield and they're waiting for their, you know, they, they know that there's certain songs that, that, that they're waiting to hear. And I don't know what that one would mean, but <laughs> they're waiting for these songs. And all of a sudden, the, the trumpet starts playing, but they're like, what does that mean? I don't recognize that, that tune. Nobody knows what to do, right? So he's saying that there has to be an understanding given. Now, here's the thing about this. Even if you said, well, I, I just read that, and, and I think unknown tongue there is talking about this Holy Ghost just coming upon them, and they're speaking in a heavenly language, and nobody can understand them. Okay, if you could, even if you could convince me of that, what he's saying here is, what does that profit anybody? Right? Unless somebody interprets it. But there's entire denominations out there who teach that that is a sign of salvation. And if, you don't, and if you haven't received that gift, then you're not saved. So if you haven't just one day started, I mean, just, I don't even want to, I might be saying something in a different way. <laughs> and you start saying something like that. Some people say, oh, look, they've been saved. They've been filled with the Holy Ghost. That's come upon them. I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Okay, So I don't know where they get that. And typically, those groups of people have other false doctrines, too. They believe you can lose your salvation. They believe you can, uh, uh, there's just several things that are pretty, uh, pretty weird. And so, you know, we studied this in the book of John. When somebody's not saved, they don't have the light, and they can read it and, and not have a clue what, what it's saying, okay? So, uh, uh, and I'm not saying we, we have it all figured out all the time, but I'm saying some of these things, you, you, I mean, it's very clear that he's saying prophesying, if you're going to speak in tongues, it doesn't do anybody any good unless they can understand you. So even if you could define speaking in unknown tongues as this gibberish, he's clearly saying it doesn't do anybody any good. Okay, so, uh, so it's supposed to be done, prophesying is supposed to be done unto edification. Um, I believe, and in verse 9, look at verse 9 there, he said, so likewise, except ye utter, no, 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 yeah, yeah, by a tongue, words easy to be understood. Now, some of us preachers have to learn this, okay, because, all right, I, I think it's good that churches have ladies meetings where they, ladies can talk to ladies because I might not know lady language. <laughs> Children's programs where ministers can speak on a child's level so they understand what's going on. It's easy to understand. I'm not against having children. I like the idea of raising them how to be in the auditorium and trying to learn and understand uh, preaching for adults. But let's be honest, a lot of it doesn't make sense to them. All right? And in fact, if you get an, uh, somebody who's very new to the faith, or maybe they're even lost, and they come in and you're using all these Christian words that nobody understands, you know, and, uh, and even reading the, the King James, I'm, I, I'm not going to read any other Bible, but I'm saying we've got to be careful sometimes and explain what we're saying because they don't know what that means. And I, and I start rambling. I sometimes just start reading through this and thinking everybody's following me, and it could be that they haven't learned that language yet. <laughs> I don't know what 
what that means. And so, so we've got to be very careful to speak in a manner that is understood by everybody. Uh, men's meetings, couples classes, you know, there's some things that uh, a couple would understand a little bit more than a single who's never been married. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's good to have all these kind of ministries. I like that. We want people to in, understand the Bible. <clears throat> but interestingly, to also, the Bible talks about, uh, uh, I mean, in this text, he talks about going out and you're speaking, you know, different languages to different people, you know. And, and, and it would be like, again, I, I use a reference, a lot of Spanish ministries, you know, and a lot of places in our country, they have uh, populations of Spanish communities, you know, in, in Oklahoma, we had a place that they called, this is, uh, this is Little Mexico, and that's uh, Little Asia, you know, or whatever. And, and these populations of people who speak those languages. You can go into those areas, and if you're gifted in being able to speak that, that language, you can go in there and, and, and prophesy. But what it says is, that is for the unbelievers, okay? And I think the implication is, you go out into the world and you preach in the gospel in these different languages or you're doing, doing whatever, that's out there, okay? But when you come in, now he's talking about prophesying. In other words, reading the Bible and understanding it and saying this is what the Bible says. It's a little different prophesying, you know, inside the house of God like this as opposed to prophesying to uh, the community knocking on doors or whatever. And so the Bible gives specific instructions regarding the the prophesying inside the church. It brings me to my next point then. In what manner should one prophesy in the church decently and in order? Look at chapter 14, verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. You know. A couple of things that we can get from that. Number one, I mean, from the text, but first of all, not necessarily in this text here, but... First of all, I believe that means if it's going to be decently in order, that means somebody has to be in charge. Okay, In the book of Titus, in the letter to Titus, Paul, I think it's in Titus 2, Paul says, I left you here that you will uh, uh, ordain elders. Let's see, how does it say? That, uh, that you will, uh, man, I, I, it's on the tip of my tongue here. Look at, at Titus 2. Set in order the things that are wanting. There, it came to me. Uh, anyway, that, so don't worry about going there. He said that you, will, I left you here, that you will set in order the things that are wanting in the church, okay? And then immediately he says, and ordain elders, okay, in every, in every place. And so the idea is, the, the, the first thing a church really needs is somebody who would be able to lead it, okay? And that would be uh, setting decency and order in a church, now, interestingly enough, there are a lot of people today that are teaching that one pastor is a, is a bad thing. And really, they ought to have a, a plurality of elders and no necessarily man in charge, but everybody just kind of votes on things and calls the shots. Now, that could be done in a way that's decently decent and in order, but a lot of times it just kind of leads to chaos and rivalries and, and uh, uh, family feuds <laughs> and stuff like that, and, and that could be a bad deal. Okay, so the first thing is, I think you can, that there, there should be pastors, of course, pastor, elder, bishop, uh, these things, the Bible makes it clear of what their roles are. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, pastor, uh, of teaching, a pastor, you can look at Ephesians 4.11. Let's go ahead and go there just for a second. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians 4.11 says this, And he gave some apostles, again, that's kind of done away with, some prophets, depending on your definition, that could be done away with, some evangelists, we have those, soul winners, people that go out and knock on doors, those who spread the gospel, uh, missionaries, and some pastors and teachers. Notice that those two go together. It says uh, apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and then some pastors and teachers, right? Now, I, th I think somebody could be a good teacher and have the gift of teaching who's not a pastor, but I think every pastor should at least be able to. In fact, that's one of the qualifications, apt to teach, okay? Having the ability to be, to, to be able to teach, and that's important for a church, okay? So, uh, so this is something that uh, a pastor is supposed to be able to do. However, I don't believe the pastor has to preach all the time. You know, they could just be supplying guest speakers. 
They could be appointing men in the church. Hey, why don't you teach this class? Hey, why don't you preach tonight? You know, there are some churches where a pastor actually takes a kind of behind-the-scenes role and puts uh, other men up here to speak that he he deems worthy, you know, and knows what they're talking about. And, and, and that's definitely a possibility. But the point of the matter is that the Bible says that the elder's job is to feed the flock. Peter said, feed the flock of God. Those who are elders, he said, for I am an elder uh, as well. And he, and he said, that is one of your primary jobs, okay? Secondly, uh, let me see here. Oh, not just that, but prophesying throughout the Bible can also be uh, considered, uh, I mean, these types of things can also be considered prophesying. Singing, praying, all those kinds. In our text, I don't remember, I didn't write it down, but in our text it even talks about that. Uh, singing, praying, all these kinds of things uh, can be considered uh, prophecy. All right, now, as far as setting things in order, I mean, as far as doing things decently in order, look at verse 26. 14.26 says, How is it then, brother? Oh, here's the verse I was trying to remember. Here, how is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, and an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. Okay, if a man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, and that, uh, and that by course. And let one interpret. Okay, you get one at a time, give them their chance to speak, and make sure they have interpreters. But if there's no interpreter, let them keep silent in the church, and let them speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. Okay, and so we're talking about just a couple at a time. Be kind of like going to a conference or something where you have one speaker gets up, and then you got a little break, and then another speaker gets up. That's definitely a possibility. That's a way uh, that you could do it. Or you could have teachers, you got a Sunday school teacher, and then you got a, you know, someone teaches the morning service, or, or whatever. These are, these are ways to do it. But the thing is, it's done decently in order. If everybody just started saying, hey, I, I got a thought on that, and they just started, you know, preaching what they know, that could cost a lot of problems, right? And there are some places where that kind of stuff happens. And so, uh, and so one of the things is, as far as decently in order, is, and pro, as far as prophecy is concerned, they need to take their time. I mean, take their turn. Okay? This actually applies also soul winning. Okay? If you've got two people standing at the door, and they're both trying to give their input and trying to win someone to the Lord, that would be a bad deal. So that's why I say, and we're going to do this on, uh, on November 10th, when we go out, hopefully there'll be a lot of churches represented here to help us out, and we're going to match people up. Okay? Hey, this person wants to do the speaking. This person is going to be what we call a silent partner. He's going to go along and just watch, okay? Maybe two people, though, will be, hey, we, we're teaming up. We both like to do it, but what we'll do is we'll take turns. You know, I'll do this house, you do the next house, and one of them be a silent partner. That way you don't have two people just like, you know, and then it gets real confusing. Things need to be done decently and in order, Okay. Um, let me see here. If someone speaks an unknown tongue, or he already said, it needs to be explained clearly or interpreted. Okay, now look at this one, verse 1434. Uh, verse, verse 14, I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 14, 34. Let, oh man, oh no. Let's back up a little. I've got to get a running start into this. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded, uh, commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, uh, what does that mean? Some people take it to the extreme. Actually, I was listening to one guy uh, preaching, and, and I heard him say, now, I hear a lot of ladies saying, amen. I just want, a I just want men, amen, and please, please, okay, because the Bible says women should keep silent. I'm not going to judge a man for saying that. I don't necessarily think it's wrong for women to say amen, okay? That's not the same. I don't believe that. That's not them usurping authority. It's not them rising up and saying, no, 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 he's wrong. Let me tell you what the... Right? That's what the Bible's trying to avoid because let's be honest. Women are very passionate 
And women have an ability to maybe cut somebody down. <laughs> women have an ability to, uh, and, and sometimes I feel like God did this. Uh, and if you go back to the Garden of Eden, I think maybe it was a little bit of a punishment. God sometimes, it seems like he did give the woman some kind of wisdom over the man. But then he says, okay, now I'm going to make the man in charge and you have to submit to him. And it's kind of like, you don't understand, God. It works so much better if I was in charge and he had to listen to me. And some men are like, it would work. It would work better. I could just submit to my wife, but I can't. Okay. And so, uh, so but the Bible says in the church that the women are supposed to remain silent. Now, another thing is some people say, you know, the woman shouldn't give up and give a testimony. Or that there are some places where a woman can't even sing a special. I think, number one, that's ridiculous. Number two, I think if the pastor uh, said, you know, and of course if he worked it out with the husband or whatever. And then there's some ladies in the church that don't even have a husband. What about them, right? But what if they said, hey, I'd like you to get up there and give your testimony. And she says, no, because women are supposed to be silent in church. <laughs> that's kind of counterintuitive, right? You're sp- <laughs> uh, I- I've seen women give up, uh, get up to give their testimony even kind of prophesy a little bit. They read the Bible and they, and they talk about what that means to them. And it's been a big blessing to the whole church. I think it's got its place. The idea is just a woman usurping authority and saying, no, he's wrong. You know, and this happens a lot in business meetings, not in this church, but I'm saying it happens in business meetings where, uh, and then here's another thing. A woman has a motherly kind of protective instinct. Okay, And so if a man chews out another, another man, or, or, you know, whatever. A man chews out another man, his wife will get up. And, How dare you talk to my husband? <laughs> right? I've seen that happen in meetings, and it's like, calm down, calm down. The thing is, the woman needs to sit on her hands and, <laughs> you know, and, and, and just be silent. Let, those, let the guys take care of it. And you say, oh, I don't think they can do a good job. Well, you leave that in God's hands, because if you're obeying the Scripture and saying, hey, I'm going to do what the Bible tells me to do, God's going to bless that. I don't know how many times my wife has, I think she's learned over the years that, because I, I, you know, sometimes I have some ideas or some thoughts that are kind of scary. Let's just be honest, everybody. (laughs) And sometimes she's been real scared. Like, I just don't know. I just don't know. And she's learned over time that if she just lets me do it, even though she she knows that there's a better way, sometimes I'll come along to that way. (laughs) Sometimes we'll go home and she'll say, I've got some advice for you. The Bible says you can do that, ladies, (laughs) okay? So, uh, so there's a very important role for women to play in this whole thing. They can be prophet, prophetesses, and they, can, they have a, uh, an important job, particularly those who are mothers raising the kids at home and teaching them the Word of God. You see that in the Bible. Uh, you see them, and uh, you know, I think they do a great job in children's ministries, uh, women's ministries, talking to one another, and all these kind of things. Very important. But there is a place. There is... Uh, there is an order that needs to be maintained, okay? <clears throat> a lot of things we can get into that we won't have, I won't have time to get into. There's one that, you know, maybe one day it'll be another message. I wasn't ready to, to work this in here now, but uh, there's even in the Bible where it talks about women having their head covered and men uncovered when they pray or, or prophesy. So what does that mean? You know, this is what has caused some people to think that women have to wear hats when they're in a in the church, and, and this is probably what's caused men to, uh, it's kind of be tradition in our society that if the man walks, man walks into a building, takes off his hat, you know, there's this, I, I don't know, the Bible talks about nature teaches you, and then it makes a reference to hair. Long hair on a man is a shame, and a woman with short hair is a shame. I'm not ready to preach that tonight, okay, but I'm saying it's in the Bible for a reason. I was telling Brother Webb earlier of some of these kind of mysterious verses in the Bible, what does that mean? And the Bible says that, uh, talking about the woman having to have her head covered, it says, because of the angels. I have no idea what that means. You've got to have your head covered because of the angels. We're going to address that one of these days. I just don't know when. (laughs) But uh, as the Lord allows me to kind of study that text out. But there are things in the Bible that uh, the things are to be done decently ordered. So, therefore, if you go into a church, or even in this church, if... If we just have a certain way of saying, hey, we're not going to allow these certain instruments to be on the platform, maybe that doesn't mean we inherently think that those instruments are bad, uh, but maybe there's just, uh, there's just some kind of way. We need to set some kind of standard. We need to have, maybe uh, there's some standards that we say, hey, we don't like kids running up and down on the platform. 
you know, uh, let's not do that. Or if you're going to be up on the platform, you need to dress a certain way. Or if you're going to take the offering, you need to dress a certain way. We don't have a whole lot of those rules established at, at this moment, but I'm saying those setting rules like that isn't necessarily wrong. And so if you go into a place and say, man, they're just like a bunch of legalists because they got this rule and that rule, rules aren't, aren't bad, okay? It's, it's good to do things decently in order. They should be, there should be a purpose, and that pur purpose should be communicated well uh, with everybody else, but, uh, but there's a reason for that. So I believe that anybody can, not only can anybody be a prophet, Everybody should desire and covet that they would have the gift of prophecy to be able to clearly understand the Bible. You can practice that at home, studying it, you know, talking about it with others, and, uh, and praying that God would help you to be able to understand it so that you could tell others. And uh, we should uh, do that, but at the same time, there's always a certain order that needs to be maintained. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you 